Do you believe art can change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. One day, when my daughter was at a routine visit with her pediatrician, the pediatrician said, you know, since I've been treating your daughter, I've had a nagging suspicion that something's going on with her. I think you need to start seeing specialists. I agreed to see the doctor she suggested, but I thought there's nothing wrong with her. How can there be? She's perfect. Four specialists later, We found ourselves at a muscular dystrophy clinic. As soon as the doctor walked into the examination room, he looked at Allegra, looked at me, and said, we'll do testing to confirm, but I feel certain she has myotonic dystrophy, and so do you. Allegra was too. This was before social media, before the internet was even a thing in my life. It felt like Allegra and I were on an iceberg that had broken off from the mainland and was quickly drifting away from all the other people in my life. I desperately needed some kind of lifeline to other people in my situation. I'm so happy to share this interview with today's guest, who creates these kind of lifelines for others living with myotonic dystrophy. Alexandra LaBeouf, who goes by Alex, is a young artist living in Canada who's used her artwork and creative ideas to build awareness around myotonic dystrophy, as well as fundraise for research for a cure. Along with her mother, Julie, they created a nationwide Canadian support group for families with this disease. When Alex was diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy as a child, she said to her mom, I want to meet somebody like me. I've learned so much from Alex and her family about the importance of community in helping to live with this disease. The first myotonic dystrophy conference Allegra and I attended featured this incredibly cool logo. This logo was a drawing of a raised fist clenching a green ribbon. That fist has a double meaning for folks with myotonic dystrophy. Being unable to release a clenched fist is a really common symptom. But the strength emanating from that fist in the drawing was unmistakable. Facing the challenges of myotonic dystrophy isn't for the faint of heart. Alex LaBeouf, the artist on today's episode, drew the design for this logo. In the myotonic dystrophy community, We call the adults who've been living with this disease since childhood warriors. And when these warriors get together, they don't sit around just talking about their disease. They're able to share their whole selves, what music they like, their favorite books, movies, and things they like to do with other people who get it. Alex is definitely a warrior and so much more, an advocate ambassador, and an artist. You want to know how you can really help me keep this show going? Follow me on your favorite listening app. So easy, right? And if you really want to give the show a boost, leave me a five-star rating or review. Hi, Alex. I am so glad that you agreed to come on the show today. Can you start just by telling people your name and some of the creative things that you do? Hi, my name is Alexandra LaBeouf. I am 23 years old and I do I do a lot of art in general considering everything and I, 
I draw, I dance, I play music, and it's really helped me out emotionally and physically. Yes. Well, we're going to talk about that, but I just want to share with people how I met you. I met you and your mom at the Myotonic Dystrophy Conference two years ago. And at this conference, they were displaying everywhere this logo that they had. And it was really cool. And I found out, I think you told me, I don't know if you're maybe your mom, but I think you told me that you drew that. And I'm wondering if you can describe what this logo looked like. What was it? This logo is actually one of three designs that I made that was submitted by different people just to try to get a bigger shot at getting it chosen, I guess. So obviously we have the hand that's in a fist. It kind of looks like the same fist as Black Lives Matter, but it's it's not. It's just a normal one that's a little more realistic. And it represents the first symptom that I ever had, that I remember having, which was my hand started to stiffen up and block and I couldn't move them. That and also the fist is a symbol of strength. And then I have a green ribbon circling it, which as we know, green is a symbol for muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy. I'm not sure if it's different colors for other kind of muscular dystrophy. I'm not sure, but it's green. And then I have a little heart on the wrist, which I actually got a tattoo of. And that's just love and community, what it represents. And I recently learned that the spot on your wrist where I have my tattoo and where I put the heart is a, it's like a kind of community related spot when you think of chakras and stuff like that. Oh, wow. I think so. My mom mentioned it. <laughs> well, that is really interesting. I just remember, yeah, this, this raised fist. In my memory, it was actually also holding the ribbon, but was it not? I think so. I think it was holding the ribbon. Yeah, so it was holding part of this green ribbon. And it is such a double meaning for those of us with myotonic dystrophy in that one of the symptoms that many people have is that you can't unclench your fist really quickly sometimes. It kind of gets frozen. I call it my hands getting locked. Your hands getting locked. Yeah. It's come to mean this symbol of strength as well. And I think that that is such a great way to sum up people who have myotonic dystrophy because there are so many different symptoms of varying degrees, but people are so valiant and resilient in terms of dealing with this. And I love that you included the idea of community because that's also a really important part of having a rare disease. I agree. Super important. When I first got diagnosed, I think the first thing I asked my mom was if I could meet anybody that was like me. That was my only request when I got diagnosed, was I wanted to meet somebody like me. That makes me cry because I have it with very mild symptoms, but Allegra, who you know, my daughter, who's also been on the podcast, has it with much more severe symptoms. And I really, really didn't care about myself so much as I wanted her to be able to meet other young people. I mean, she was diagnosed as a child. She never met anyone as a child, but then, or as a teenager, but then finally, by going to these myotonic dystrophy events, she was able to meet you and so many other people. And that really helped her in many ways. I'm wondering, do you have a similar story? I know that I know that there are other people in your family who have this disease as well, but I'm wondering for you what it was like when you first met a group of peers who had the same disease. So most of my family has it. So on my dad's side, all of my aunts and uncle have it. Like my dad and all of his siblings have it. So three out of three, my only cousin has it. And me, my dad, and my brother have it. So my mom and my sister were the only two that are unaffected. I was really surrounded by it, but this was my family. This was just who they were. It wasn't the same as meeting somebody that has the same thing. And the first person I met was at the Muscular Dystrophy Canada Walk in North Bay. We have a walk for muscular dystrophy as a whole. So it's 
all of the many, 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 many different kinds of muscular dystrophy. And I met someone that doesn't have the same kind, but she does have similar symptoms. It's just not the same kind of muscular dystrophy. Her name was Jay Lee, and every time we go to Ottawa, I visit her. We became really close friends. I was a bridesmaid at her wedding. So she was the first person I met that was like me. And then when I went to the conference and I met people that had the same kind as me, it was like, we all look the same. Like my mom, she calls us the Smurfs because we all kind of, we all kind of look the same and we call all kind of act the same. And it was like, when you go to a space like that, you don't talk about myotonic dystrophy. It's just like talking to a best friend you haven't seen in years. Yeah. It was awesome. And my favorite part is always the dance at the end. So the group that you're involved in, which for short is called JOAs, which is Juvenile Onset yeah. Adults, you guys pretty much take over that dance and the rest of us <laughs> just try to keep up. And it's so fun to be a part of that. I love it. I'm Now I can't wait for the next one. So, But we're going to talk about all the other creative things you do. So you draw. What other creative things do you do? Other than drawing and painting and all the visual art stuff. I was a competitive dancer from the age of 10, I believe. I think I was 10. I was in the fifth grade. So between eight and 10. I did that. And I also took some ukulele lessons and piano lessons when I was really young. So I started off with piano lessons and voice lessons. And then I moved on to ukulele as the year went, went by. Right. We also ran out of a piano. <laughs> so our, our piano at home was not very good. So we kind of left that. <laughs> That's interesting. I think that just in learning more about you, it seems like music, I mean, obviously drawing is big for you, but it seems like music is also really important to you. And so just talking about the ukulele. What are some of the things that you've gotten out of learning to play an instrument like that? Well, my mom's side is a very musical family. Like, my prepared uh, plays the accordion. One of my uncles plays the guitar, the other the violin. So I have a very musical family on my mom's side of the family. So which is probably where I get it and where my sister gets it. She likes to play the piano and we both sing a little. So I really wanted to do the ukulele just because I, it was something that I learned that I enjoy and I was able to use it in my vocals class at school. And I was able to play for my family when I felt like it or when it was usually when it was a birthday, I would learn one of the favorite songs and that was a birthday gift. And I realized that as I was playing it, my hands would get sore, but they would get stronger too. I realized that if I keep doing this, this is beneficial not only for me, but for my hands and my muscles, like that this could help. So it kind of made me almost like encouraged to learn more songs and play more. Right. And I think that that's something that, you know, if you don't have this disease, you know, thinking about the ways that using your hands, whether it's playing an instrument or drawing, can really help you to strengthen your hands. And then what about singing? You say you sing a little bit, but I suspect you sing more than that. Well, it depends if I'm alone in my car yeah. or I'm actually in a house with people. Well, let's, let's talk about when you're alone. Do you sing a lot more when you're alone? Yes, I, I do sing more when I'm alone, mostly because no one can hear me. So it's not as embarrassing, I guess. I guess it helps with the like, stress relieving more than anything else. Mm. I'm assuming, I'm not entirely sure, but it does help a little bit with the pronunciation of some words. Because I know that as my symptoms progress, the ability to talk will be get harder. Mm -hmm. I've seen a speech therapist uh, before, so she helps me a little more with some words that I had a had a harder time saying. So maybe singing helps, maybe it doesn't. I don't really know. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> right. Well, there's so many reasons to sing regardless, but 
Allegra also used to see a speech therapist. And then at a certain point, she started singing and doing other things. And it, a lot of the people who worked with her decided, you know what, let her keep doing that. That is a form of therapy. And you're so right about pronouncing things. But I also feel for myself, I sing a lot and it changes my mood. Do you ever find that? Yeah, it does. Depends on what I'm listening to, though. I have some songs that are quite depressing. And then I have others that are really like upbeat and happy. But helping does help my mood. But even if you sing a depressing song, isn't there something about singing along that's kind of like a release in a way? I don't know. Yeah, the like a stress relieving kind of thing. Or even I'm just like in a bad mood or I'm just not feeling it that day, just getting in my car and going to school and I'm singing something, I'll usually get to class in a happier mood than when I left home. Yeah, it's so interesting. You sent me little notes in preparation for us talking. And when you talked about singing as a way to work with anxiety, and I started thinking about that for myself as well. Like why? Because if I'm here, especially by myself, I sing almost all day. And I don't feel, for the most part, very much anxiety. And I wonder about the connection between those two. If it's a long habit to sing a lot, and then that reduces anxiety. I'm not sure. I just know that sometimes if I'm anxious or something, I'll start humming a tune or I'll put in my AirPods and I'll put some music on and I'll sing along or something, and usually that gets me out of the flight or fight mode. I, I used to have it a lot more when I was younger. I'm, I'm better at handling my anxiety now, but when I was younger, one of the things I would do to try to get out of the flight or fight, would I would hum something or I'd put my earbuds in and blast my music and just try to get out of that cycle. The other thing I know that you guys did that I want to ask you about, because I didn't know about this. Did you say that you had a paint night? I did. Can you tell, what is that? So this was back in 2021, maybe. The first one we ever had was because I was made the ambassador for the muscular dystrophy walk. I was made the ambassador for that year. So one of the jobs was I need to do fundraising. And then I was like, well, I don't want to just stand and collect funds at like a grocery store or something. Like that wasn't something that interests me. So I decided, well, why don't we make a paint night? So we rented, before we made it virtual, we rented a little area. We had our table set out. We made homemade little stands with pizza boxes for the canvases. And we had a local artist come in and she kind of like taught us-ish how to make a painting. So the first one we did was like a landscape, kind of like Bob Ross style. And it was all stuff that was very easy to do. So it wasn't like, you don't need to be good at painting to do that. So we had her paint in, it was a, kind of like a paint in wine night. So if you were old enough, you had a glass of wine while painting. And if not, we just had other drinks for the younger kids who were not 19 yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should, we should, you're in Canada. So you have a different mm -hmm. drinking age. 19, unless you want to take a road trip, then it's 18 in Quebec. <laughs> the other thing I should mention, because I think it's really cool, is that you are bilingual. I am. Did you say Papere? Yes, my, on my mom's side. Uh, it's That's your grandfather. Is that grandfather, the word for grandfather? Yes, Papere is the word for oh, grandfather. Papier. So on my mom's side, I have Papere and mère, and on my dad's side, it's grandma and grandpa. Okay. 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 Well, I, I'm dying to ask you now if on your dad's side, they're primarily English speaking, or is it just to differentiate? My dad was raised bilingual, but my grandmother is very, she's like very English. Well, like knew none, no French. While my grandfather, he grew up again bilingual. So they, they tried to raise them bilingual, but they're more on the English side. Like, we'll speak more English with on the narrow side, while with my mom's side, it's pure Asterville French, which yes. is a little different yeah. than, like, you'd hear in Quebec. It's there. There's a lot of slang. 
Right. What kind of French did you say it was? I called it Asteville French just because we're in a... Because there's Quebec French, there's French from France, and then there's also French from Sturgeon Falls, which is right on the edge of North Bay. And then on the other right. end, there's East Ferris, which is just a bunch of little communities. And we kind of like have our own French almost. Like wow. some of the words we say are different or the accent is slightly different. It's just something that's there. <laughs> that's very cool that you have both of these languages and that, yeah, I'm envious. I do speak French, but not I'm not bilingual by any means. So, you know, this whole season is talking about connections. And what I'm wondering is if you've ever felt challenged to connect. I know we talked a little bit before about this feeling of wanting to meet other people who have your disease. And I relate to that so strongly. But I'm also wondering if you've ever felt challenged to connect and if you've like doing creative things has helped you with that. I've always been super shy and timid and I had social anxiety. I kind of a little bit still do. But I know that when I started recreational dancing at first, I had a hard time connecting with people and I just doing that kind of took my mind off of having to talk to other people. But then with the competitive part of it, I didn't really have a choice because this is my team. So I, I got to speak with other people, which was a little bit easier and progressively got easier and easier as time went along because I got to know these people. I saw them like literally every night, except on weekends because I had dance classes for a good three hours every night from Monday wow. to Friday. <laughs> I was probably at the studio more than I was at home, wow. which is kind of weird to say now. But yeah, I was at the studio a lot. So these people became almost like my dance family. I had my family at home and then my dance family, which is my team that I traveled with and practiced with every night. And I also realized that it's almost easier to talk to people when you're doing something creative because you're not really focusing on who you're talking to. You're just, it's easier. And I'm not entirely sure why. That's really interesting. I have heard, you know, as a mom, they talk about like how to talk to your teenagers or your kids. And they do always recommend that you do it while you're doing something else, like maybe taking a hike or, you know, something where your body is occupied in a certain way, as opposed to just sitting like across a table and talking to them. Do you think that that has anything to do with it? Or do you think it's something else for you? I'm not entirely sure, but I have heard that a lot of art therapists do that with younger kids. When they try to figure out what's bothering them, if they won't talk about it, they'll get them to draw a picture and they'll talk to them while they're doing that. So I do know that it's a, a way to get people to open up, but I'm not entirely sure if, if it's the same thing because like, I have an easier time talking to people that are in my art classes than I would talking to just anybody, which could be because I'm drawing. It could be because I'm not drawing. So I can't say that it's because I'm drawing, but I just find there are easier people to talk to. That's interesting. Well, now I'm wondering if it's because everybody is revealing some part of themselves in their creative work that makes it feel like some sort of barrier has been lowered. Do you feel that at all or am I just? Actually, that's pretty accurate because a lot of our themes, at one point I had a theme that was I had to speak about place and space and I made an entire project on the fact that how we moved from the city into the country. So like how different it was and how my house took a couple years before it became my home. There's a lot of subjects that I can relate to that I have to relate to for most of my projects and everybody does. So it is very revealing, I guess. Do you find for yourself that it's easier sometimes to express something through a creative work than it is just to say it, especially something, you know, like feeling 
this move and feeling like it took a while for you to feel like it was home, would something like that, something that's personal and about emotions, would that be easier for you to express that in creative work than it would be just to say it? Definitely easier to put it like in an art piece or find a song that relates to it. It's much easier than having to actually use my words to express it. Well, I'm curious about how you see your creative future. Do you think you might want to go into a field where you're using your your skills at art? Or what do you feel? Or is it always going to be just something that you're doing for the pleasure of it? I'm not entirely sure what I want to do in the future, but I do know that I want to incorporate art in it somehow. So I will be graduating with a minor in fine arts. So that's like visual arts and painting and drawing, sketching, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not entirely sure what I want to do with it yet. But after I take my year off and go back to school and actually figure out what I want to do, I do want to try and incorporate art into it so that it's something that I keep doing because I know that it helps me. And it could probably help other people too. For sure. And then we'll go from there. Uh Uh-huh. Have you found doing creative work that it strengthened bonds with people you were already friends with? I I think so. Like, there was some people that before, like, I knew who they were, and they knew who I was. We, like, we were, like, acquaintances. But we, because I found, like, oh, you, you do this, or you like to do that. And I was like, yeah, like, me too. And it just... We became closer friends because of those, because of those uh, shared interests. So that sometimes happened. But again, I was very shy, so usually I wasn't the one to make those connections. They usually had to like ask first or start the conversation for me to actually engage. <laughs> right, right. But you said earlier that when you're doing something creative, it actually lessens that shyness. I think you said sort of you had a little bit of social anxiety. So. Yes, but uh, like it's still there. It's just somebody who's going to start a conversation with somebody I don't know. Yeah. But when they do like start the conversation, I have an easier time joining in and talking more like it's a friend than just somebody I met. Right. That just happens to be in the same class as me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It's been so wonderful to connect with you and your mom. And then last year I met your dad. And I've just always wanted to ask you, especially about drawing that MDF logo, because I think it meant a lot to a lot of people. Did you get a lot of feedback from people talking to you about it? I did. It was almost a little bit overwhelming because I showed up at the conference and everybody knew my face. (laughs) <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay. hi, who are you? Because <laughs> every, everybody knew who I was, and I was like, oh. It was just something that never really happened before. Uh, for a long time, I felt, like, I felt like just another patient, and that was something I definitely did not want to be. That was like the last, like I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to be able to help. I did not want to be just another patient. And then Facebook showed up with an ad that was like, hey, we have a competition for a logo and it was COVID and I was bored and had nothing else better to do. So I was like, why not? Why not do this to spend my time? And then I got a call telling me that I won and now everybody knows my face. (laughs) So you can find me on Google. Oh, wow. Amazing. Amazing. For people listening do you want people to reach out and connect with you or do you, cause you can give us a social media post or something. Um, and if not, that's fine too. What is your preference? They can definitely contact me. I like talking to people when I did have, like, I have people, some people contacting me that are like, Oh, my children got diagnosed. And most of the time I connect with them and then I'm like, Hey, we have a Canadian support group. Let me give you a link or put you on a registration list. So I do appreciate when people reach out. Do you want them to reach out to you? I don't know if you're on, are you on Facebook? I am on Facebook. Okay. So do you want them to reach out on Facebook or some other way? They can contact me through uh, Facebook, through Messenger. I will warn people. 
I rarely do check the messengers that are not on my contact list, so you might want to friend me first and then contact me because I might not see your message till a long time after. Yes, sounds very reasonable. And that is one thing I forgot to talk about is that you and your mom started that support group in Canada because there wasn't one. There wasn't one indeed. Uh, I know that there was a woman named Teresa Buffoni. I think she won the Kilovitic Award last year. Which award Which award was this? The Kilovitic Memorial Award, the one I won in 2022. It mm-hmm. was the one I, during the virtual meeting, that is the one that I... I got, but she used to run a support group in Ottawa, but she, she wasn't able to anymore. So me and my mom decided, hey, let's make a virtual support group so everybody can join because Canada's a big place and not everybody can go to Ottawa once a month. <laughs> right. Yeah. You and your mom together are such a powerhouse of support. So it doesn't surprise me that people know your face, know your name because I think you guys have done so much in terms of really creating community and connections through your advocacy around myotonic dystrophy. And then you made that beautiful logo. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, Alex. Well, thank you so much. Say hi to your mom for me. And thanks for coming on the show. No problem. I had fun. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Thank you, Alex LaBeouf, for being on the show today to talk about the role that art plays in your life. I love that it helps you connect with others. I'll put Alex's Facebook page in the show notes for this episode. It's a great reminder that if you're feeling alone with this type of diagnosis for you or a child, connecting with someone else who's gone through this is in itself healing. I'll also put a link to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation in the show notes. It's very, very possible and probable that a cure will be found for this disease. If you care to donate, your donations will go towards research for a cure and treatment. Do you have a story to share about the role that art has played in your life? Share it with me in a voicemail and I'll share it on the show. Just go to my website, arthealsallwoundspodcast.com and you'll see where you can click to leave me a voicemail. Every time you leave a story, you help someone else. And if you feel able and would like to support this show, you can do that at my website too. This show is completely independent with no sponsors. Any bit you can donate helps me out a lot. Thanks for listening. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Thank you.